presenterà la sua relazione Carlos Machado, Public Monument and Civic Life, The End of the State You Have It. piacere stare qui stamattina e per questo e anche per tutto chi, quello che ho imparato già e certamente imparerò. Vorrei ringraziare prima di tutto gli organizzatori di questo seminario. Um, vorrei anche, anzi devo per forza scusarmi per parlare non in italiano e neanche in portoghese l'ultimo fiore del Lazio come diciamo da noi ma in inglese. Statues are fascinating objects especially statues of those who are dear to us, as the Vir Clarissimus and former Prefectus Urbi Rutilius Namatianus noted during his visit to Pisa on the way to his home in Gaul in 417. I quote, here was shown to me the statue of my revered father, erected by the Pisans in their forum. The honor done to my lost parent made me weep. Tears of a saddened joy wet my cheeks with their flow. For my father once was governor of Tuscany and administered the jurisdiction assigned to the six fascists. And he continues a few verses later. Nor was my father mistaken, being an equal favorite. Più um, vicino? Okay. Uh, nor was my father mistaken, being an equal favorite with those whom he esteemed. Their mutual regard inscribes in verse undying gratitude. An old man who can remember him made known to their sons how firm of purpose he was and at the same time how kindly. They are glad that I myself have not fallen off from my parents' honors and eagerly give me a warm welcome to his, for his sake and my own. There is certainly more than the materiality of bronze or marble to a statue. Being an ornament in the forum, it was part of a specific material culture, a conspicuous element in the landscape of ancient cities. It was a material representation of something or someone and as such, it generated responses from its viewers. Admiration and gratitude from the peasants, pride and joy from Rutilius Amatianus. Perhaps more importantly, the dedication of a statue of an aristocrat in a public ex space expressed and reinforced a specific set of social and political relations. It is not a coincidence, therefore, that Rutilius should have been led by the town citizens themselves to see his father's statue probably during the splendid reception prepared for his arrival. The people of Pisa knew too well that, in the context of late imperial Italy, personal connections and patronage were an important asset, and the dedication of a public monument to one's father could play an important role in this, in this case. The practice of dedicating statues was one of the distinctive characteristics of ancient society. Citizens, city councils, magistrates, and benefactors in cities all over the Mediterranean erected statues to gods, heroes, patrons, and rulers. Statues celebrated special occasions in the life of the empire, expressed gratitude and loyalty to patrons, and reaffirmed the importance of the bonds between civic communities, their gods, and the cities where they lived. Rather than a mere epiphenomenon, the statue habit was intimately linked to the ways in which ancient societies worked. Late antiquity was particularly important in this sense. The end of antiquity was marked by the general collapse of the statue habit in different parts of the empire. It is my aim here to analyze the decline and fall of the statue habit in the case of Italy, considering its regional specificities and also its rhythms. This might help us to raise questions not only with regard to, the, to why the practice of dedicating statues disappeared, but also the relationship between this process and the developments in the dynamics of civic life and in the monumental apparatus of late antique cities in the peninsula. So what I'm going to do here is basically simple. In the first place, I'm going to point out some of the most important features of the late antique statue habit, very quickly. After that, I will throw a quick glance at the decline of the practice of dedicating statues, considering its regional diversity and rhythms. And finally, I will raise a few of the questions that have been tormenting me especially the relationship between the decline of the statue habit and the transformations in civic life and in the material fabric that affected the cities of Italy in the fifth century. There is one important warning I must make before I start, however. The work I'm going to present here is part of a wider project concerned with the evolution of the statue habit in late antique Italy and Africa, 
as I am sure you will notice, this work is still at its early stages, and the material I'm going to present here is still very provisional, let alone the conclusions. But we can leave these words of caution for a moment, move on to the first part of the paper, and try to define the latent ink statue habit. As Rutilius Namatianus would gladly acknowledge, statues were still treasured objects in late antiquity. In that case, a statue was dedicated in the forum by the people of Pisa to a provincial governor of Gallic origin. As Rutilius tells us, his father was praised in the inscription for qualities that were usually expected from officials, a combination of firmness and kindness. Whether these were his actual qualities or this was a rhetorical artifice in the representation of the ideal governor is a different question. What interests me here is precisely the fact that statues were still part of a political economy of honors that was known at least since the late Republican period. CIL 9 uh, 11, 17 on the left is a marble statue base found in ancient Iclanum, now in the National Museum in Naples. It records the dedication of a statue to the Emperor Constanti Constantine by the governor of Apulia et Calabria in the early 4th century. The base on the right is still on display in the Colosseum a record of the works carried out by Decius Marius Venantius Basilius, Prefectus Urbi in 484, after the amphitheater was badly damaged by an earthquake. These examples illustrate the variety of situations in which statues could be dedicated. No inscription, however, can describe the eagerness with which Roman aristocrats competed for such honors, as well as Ammianus Marcellinus, who noted that, and I quote, some of these men, and he's talking about senators, some of these men eagerly strive for statues, thinking that by them they can be made immortal, as if they would gain a greater re reward from senseless brazen images than from the consciousness of honorable and virtuous conduct. There is no shortage of evidence to confirm this fact. Statues were important monuments dedicated by a variety of agents with different purposes on different occasions. In other words, not very different from the early empire. What this evidence does not show, however, is that the context in which these dedications took place was considerably different from the times of Pliny or Trajan. This can be more clearly seen, seen when we look at the evidence from inscribed statue bases as a whole, and it is on this material that I want to focus here. Statue bases, like the ones you see on the slide, have the advantage of being durable, more resistant than the statues themselves. It's very rare, only in cities like Aphrodisias, where you, you manage to find statues and the bases uh, very near to each other. In general, you find uh, mainly the, the bases. The large number of bases dis discovered over the past five centuries is particularly important, especially because the dedications inscribed on these objects provide us with important information concerning the very act of dedication who dedicated, to whom, when, and why. I mean, there is a lot that we can learn about this society but from looking at this material. This material has been the subject of countless studies by historians, epigraphists, and archaeologists with different interests in mind. It is possible, however, to follow a different approach if we consider the statue bases preserved and collected in epigra epigraphic corpora in a broader perspective as part of a wider historical process. This graph presents the total number of statue bases that I have been able to identify so far, divided by types of dedication, covering the period from the accession of Diocletian to the Byzantine invasion. It might reinforce our initial impression of strong continuities with earlier periods. The predominance of statues dedicated to emperors and members of their families, 38%, and specially honorific dedications, Statues dedicated to senators, governors, and members of the local elite, 40%, for example. There is a great variety of types of dedication, including to pagan deities. Although the small number recorded indicates important changes underway. I think this is a point where we can see a clear difference between earlier with early periods. One category that deserves some explanation is the one that here I called not mentioned. It's a bit of a coward uh, attitude. Uh, these are statues whose dedication uh, mention the name of the person responsible for setting the statue up, uh, but not the recipient of this honor. Uh, this category is not irrelevant at all, 
Uh, it represents 15% of all dedications. That's 84 statue bases out of 576. And it's, it's traditionally seen as referring to statues displayed as works of art. I mean, if you think in terms of works of art, you see why I prefer to call it not mentioned. Uh, representations of classical subjects, such as the Spinario and the Apoxiomenus described by Pliny, but also the statues of deities moved from temples, as in the case of the famous inscription from a statue based in Verona. In this case, the fact that the language of the dedication is essentially like empty of any religious association, if the statue was, dedicated, had, was previously dedicated to a deity, it, that is not mentioned, that is totally ignored. And this might indicate that the statue had been conceptually moved from the category of sacred to secular, that is, from the capital to the forum. It is important to bear in mind that the data presented here is still far from complete. So far, I have collected the evidence from the volumes of CIL dedicated to Italy, and it is clear that these numbers are going to change once I incorporate information from more up-to-date publications, such as Lanay Epigraphic. Nevertheless, the information preserved in the old volumes of CIL amounts to a significant number of 576 statue bases, large enough to illustrate important trends and yet manageable enough for historical analysis. I mean, I'm sure that these numbers are going to go up, uh, and you can see ju that just by browsing through the bibliography on late antique Italy, uh, but I'm not so sure what are the trends that we can see from 576 statue bases uh, whether these trends are going to change significantly, and I think it's worth considering this material anyway. Uh, now, this graph is perhaps more useful, as it reveals the very uneven distribution of this material. The cities of Anonarian Italy are responsible for a mere 5%, or 30 bases in total. There is an obvious um, distortion in the case of Rome, as you can see, with 64%. And there are two main reasons for that. In the first place, because of the size and importance of the city and its elite. In the second place, because in the case of Rome specifically, we have the spectacular publication of the more vo recent volumes of CIL 6, something that is badly missing for the rest of Italy. Um, there are 365 bases from Rome between 284 and uh, 535. Just to give you an idea, the rest of Italy has 211 bases, North Africa, counting from what the work of Claude Le Pelé, 317. So Rome itself has more uh, bases than North Africa. Aphrodisias, just to put it in perspective, because Aphrodisias is so uh, important uh, for everybody, uh, 35 statue bases were counted in uh, Charlotte Rouchet's uh, work. Uh, this imbalance, imbalance is important, however, and should not be excluded from our picture. Vicissitudes of publication apart there was a marked contrast between Rome and the other Italian cities, a contrast that not even the presence of the imperial court in Milan or later in Ravenna managed to change. Before we consider this imbalance, however, we must first consider the proper context in which these dedications were taking place, which leads me to the second point of this paper, the decline and fall of the statue habit. Now, this is a very bad copy of a graph that was produced by Bert Smith in the 1980s, uh, charting the decline in the production of newly uh, produced uh, imperial statues. Um, we can be more specific uh, for the case of Italy when we consider the statue bases that I have uh, collected. Uh, I think this gives a, us a better idea of what we're dealing with. The number of dedications declined steadily during the fourth century, from 199 in the, period, in the first period, 284 to 337, to 106 in 379 to 423. But it was in the fifth century that the statue habit collapsed, 26 between 423 and 455, and mere two dedications in the final period. It is clear from this graph that although it is important to consider the fourth century's antecedents of this crisis, it is really the fifth century that astonishes us and requires explanation. If this is true, then we should leave aside the provinces of Anonarian Italy. In this case, the number of dedications, which was already quite small in the early 4th century, only 19, had practically vanished by the beginning of the 5th tree basis, never to pick up again. It is interesting to notice, at least in this case, that whatever importance the statue habit had in the cities of northern Italy, 
it was connected to the presence of a strong imperial power at the time of the Tetrarchy and Constantine. But let us turn to, some, to the very different, and I would actually call it unique case of Rome for a moment, and maybe we can have a clearer picture of what was going on. In the case of the home of empire and every virtue, in Ammianus' words, the practice of dedicating statues lasted for much longer. The number of bases remained stable until the last quarter of the fourth century, when it began to decline. Uh, we have 109 for, most, uh, for the two first periods. Um, it was in the 420s that the numbers collapsed, 22 bases, 15, and 1 in the final period. The complexity of Rome might also be seen in terms of the diversity of dedications. Whereas in Annonarian Italy, imperial statue bases amounted to 22 out of 30, or 73%, in the case of Rome, we see a much more even distribution. Emperors were still honored with a large share of the dedications, only surpassed by honorific dedications in general. In Rome, this category includes not only senators who received 118 dedications, but also court and military officials, pagan priests, and even athletes. A tiny minority, it is true, with two bases, but still fascinating for its exceptionality, especially because the two uh, bases of athletes found in Rome are from the uh, late 4th and early 5th century. One, one might ask, as I have done elsewhere, whether the continued practice of dedicating statues to pagan gods as late as the statue of Minerva dedicated in front of the Curia in the Forum in the 470s, should really be seen as a sign of religious continuity. If these dedications are more revealing of cultural interests rather than commitment to paganism, then they should be considered as part of the still relevant practice of dedicating statues as ornaments, a practice that remained important for the entire period under consideration here. We should not forget an important factor observed by Pliny the Younger, to dedicate, to dedicate a statue in a place like the Forum was as honorific as having a statue there. Accordingly, Rome's population of statues was enlarged not only by the initiative of its local elite or the urban prefect, but also emperors who dedicated 24 statues, imperial officials, imperial officials 22 and provincials 14. What these numbers suggest is that the uniqueness of Rome was due to a variety of factors the relative importance of the city, the splendor of its monumental apparatus, as well as the wealth and cultural conservatism of its political elite, still keen on being seen as traditional patrons. It is the presence of this same elite that might explain, at least in part, the pattern of the statue habit in the cities of Italia Suburbicaria. In fact, the extent of, to which the cities of southern Italy follow the same development as Rome is striking. Here, the critical drop also took place in the first half of the 5th century. And even if the numbers were never as high as in Rome, the important fact is that statues were still dedicated at the end of our period. The same similarity can be observed in terms of the diversity of types of dedication. Here also, honorific dedications were slightly more important than imperial ones, and statues were still set up for the embellishment of cities, even in the 5th century. Now, I do apologize for throwing so many numbers at you, uh, but rather than to confuse you, what I want to do here is to show that this type of analysis might shed some important life on, uh, light on uh, the urban life in late antique Italy. Now, the problem with this type of evidence and this type of cons uh, graphs is that they, they don't show us exactly what lies, lies behind the dedication of a statue. Now, for this, we have to turn to uh, the famous uh, orator Quintus Aurelius Simicus, who, in a surprisingly ferocious letter, provides us with the best illustration of the complexities involved in such an initiative. It's uh, letter 9.115, where he complains to a friend about a decision made by the cities, citizens of a North African town. He doesn't mention the name of the town. The decision made public in a decree was either to not dedicate statues to him or to remove those that had been previously dedicated. The context is not clear. Having been proconsul of Africa in 373 and 74, Sima considered these the reproachful acts of the envious and the dishonorable decisions of the ungrateful. What we see at work here is both the expectation of a Roman noble and the political mechanisms that were put in motion for the dedication of a statue. Political circumstances, pressures, and commitments were important factors at play. It is clear that the decision to dedicate a statue was, to a great extent, a political decision. To so embellish a forum with a statue moved from a temple to honor a local patron or a provincial governor or to display loyalty to a distant imperial court. These were options that became 
more relevant at a time when the number of statues uh, declined. One can see that whereas the number of dedications to emperors and members of the imperial family was considerably large up to the death of Constantine, it dropped dramatically after that. This happened at a time when the number of dedications to patrons underwent a massive increase. This should be seen in conjunction with the number of statues dedicated to provincial governors, I mean patrons and governors, who usually came from the, social, the same social group, as you can see from this table. So uh, I think what, what is, is going on here is that the communities and cities of southern Italy, uh, they are choosing to honor not a distant imperial power, but rather uh, landowners and officials who actually are nearby, who, to whom uh, they are subjected most of the time. It was not every day that a Gallic senator stopped by to see an honor granted to his father, but we do know of the frequent visits paid by senators such as Simicus to their properties in Campania, for example. After the end of Constantine's reign, the statue habit was progressively dominated by members of the senatorial aristocracy to the detriment of the local municipal elites. It is very tempting to describe this process as a manifestation of the increased control of the senatorial elite over the instruments of government in late imperial Italy at a time when traditional local magistratures and city councils faded away. Although there is good evidence to support this view, we must be careful not to ignore that there, there are important elements of continuity. The latest statue base dedicated in Suburbicare in Italy that I managed to identify is the monument erected to Flavius Pius Maximus, Virus Pectabilis, governor of Semnium, and patron of Venathrum by the Ordo and Populus of this city. Now, this is a very good example of what Claude Lepelet called the permanence de la cité classique. Uh, another good example of continuity, but much earlier, is uh, the statue from uh, mid fourth century, Spellum, dedicated to Caius Matrinius Aurelius. Uh, it's a statue that we could easily be taken for, uh, as belonging to the third century if it weren't for the references to uh, the fact that he was a, a priest of the cult of the Gens Flavia and to the fact that it calls the city not his Pelum, but uses its Constantinian name. So it is possible that there is a statue base somewhere waiting to be redated to the fifth century, and we always have to bear that in mind. Now, on the other hand, specific cases, specific examples like this one, uh, they shouldn't be uh, used as an argument against a general picture that I think is very clear from the statue bases when they're taken as a whole. Now, rather than speaking of vitality of the traditional forms of la civic life in the fifth century, we should be aware of the possibility that there were important elements of continuity in a context of wider historical transformation. This possibility is reinforced when we consider who were the groups and agents responsible for the dedications of these statues. It is remarkable that institutions such as the Ordo and the populace of different towns would still be involved in this practice until as late as the early 5th century. But as you can see, this involvement that was already declining by the end of the 4th century uh, disappeared by the 450s, at the same time as the statue habit uh, disappeared. This graph is particularly revealing as it takes us to the core of what the statue habit was originally about local communities honoring and expressing gratitude to patrons, benefactors, and rulers in the public sphere. The demise of this classic model of social and political relationship is also indicated by a law from 398 addressed to the Praetorian Prefect of Italy. The law is not seeking to control the erection of all statues, but only of those dedicated to governors in post. By trying to prevent government officials from abusing their powers and forcing their subjects to dedicate statues to them, the law actually shows the degree to which aristocrats were interested in the system of honors. In demanding statues from those who were subject to their authority, late Roman officials were subverting the very principle that established that such honors should be an acknowledgement and reward for their virtues and deeds. The dedication of statues had become, in this context, an act of submission rather than gratitude. If we could still speak of a strong continuity in the political economy of honors between the early empire and the fourth century, the situation in the fifth century was completely different. Rather than a structural component of society, the dedication of statues was, was a consciously archaic form of honoring someone at a time when urban spaces were experiencing a rapid decay. Now, there are many examples of, uh, of uh, what was going on in cities in uh, fifth century Italy. Uh, mainly due to the works of archaeologists, um, some of them here in this room, and Professor Brogiolo has just uh, 
described uh, what was going on in fifth century Italy in terms of uh, cities. Um, now, it's clear that uh, what we have here is a process of um, co contraction of spaces in, in the area of cities. And this is indicated by statue bases like the ones that you see here, the one on the left from Ostia and the one on the right from the Roman Forum, now, suggesting that parts of the cities were being abandoned and these statues were being moved to the traditional or most, most important uh, monumental complexes. When Procopius visited Rome in the 530s, he thought it necessary to mention the statues of famous Greek artists that could still be seen in the Vespasianic Temple of Peace. He also thought it important to mention the statue of Domitian that he saw in the Forum on the Clivus Capitolinus, a bronze statue that had clearly been put together at some later stage, but that he assumed to have been made as a realistic copy of the emperor's corpse reassembled by his wife with this specific purpose. Not many years earlier, Cassiodorus had already shown the same interest for wild speculation. The bronze elephants that could still be seen on the Via Sacra should be restored, he told the urban prefect Honorius, and I quote, so that those who have never seen the living animal might have opinion of it through its image. Although elephants were still symbols of empire, portraying the variety of nature's richness within Rome's frontiers, their military and triumphal associations are not mentioned at all. The fall of the statue habit was so dramatic that, already by the end of the 5th and the beginnings of the 6th century, some of the most learned visitors to Rome could show an astonishing lack of knowledge of the vocabulary of honors that had for centuries informed this practice. To conclude, all in all, the statue habit died because it stopped being socially relevant. Statues were not the material and symbolic expression of a specific social order anymore. They were rather an exercise in antiquarianism, a product of the vanity and pride of the Roman elites that wanted to be seen in a traditional way. It is not a coincidence that no statue base of a bishop was ever discovered in the whole Mediterranean world. Members of the Christian elite, ecclesiastical or not, did not abandon the idea of expressing their power and authority in public. They had rather chosen other methods more suitable for the spaces in which they exercised, er, exercised their power. But I don't want to conclude with such beautiful and uplifting, uplifting images but rather with something dirty and ugly. The statue base erected in the forum, celebrating the victories of the Emperor Honorius and the good advice and wisdom of his, of his Magister Militum, Stilico, was discovered in the area between the Rostra and the Comitium. It couldn't be more prestigious. An area previously peopled with statues of emperors, senators, and the heroes of old times was now the spot where Romans could see a bronze likeness of a barbarian general. What we see here is an eloquent sign of the times. The base of an equestrian statue, it was turned around and reused. By the beginning of the fifth century, the statue habit was already very different from what it had been during classical times. It is perhaps not a coincidence that the Damnatio of Stilicho's memory after his assassination in August 408 was immediately followed by the invasion that led to the sacking of Rome itself. Thank you. <laughs>